think we've become almost paralyzed in our ability to deal with climate change issues. Uh, we seem to be unable to make the kind of informed public decisions, the comprehensive decisions that we need to. And I think a lot of that is because of the um, simplistic and uh, adversarial governance processes that we use. Um, we need to commit to and, and fund well-designed processes that can help us bring our best selves forward to do this kind of work. When I've worked with different cultures, um, I'm finding that people really, really do want to make a difference. They really do want to make a change for the future. And I think uh, people want to work for the common good, both locally and globally. We're already doing a lot to take care of our local commons, such as forests, food growing, and culture. But with climate change, it's becoming more obvious that we need to be thinking as global citizens, making collective decisions about our global commons, such as oceans and atmosphere. In this world of uncertainty, we are facing uh, a whole bunch of problems simultaneously. We're in a situation of converging stresses. And this is something I stress in my last book, uh, The Upside of Down. I identify uh, an, a number of challenges that humankind faces. I call them tectonic stresses, uh, pressures that are building up under the surface of the global system. It's, it's common characteristic across all of these instances of social breakdown, that the societies and institutions have been overwhelmed by multiple shocks and stresses simultaneously. And that is exactly the kind of situation we're creating in the world today, which is one reason I'm so enormously concerned for the future of my children. If you'd asked climate scientists half a dozen years ago or ten years ago how, what they thought of the, the, the Earth's climate problem, uh, they would say, well, it's very serious, we need to do something about it. If you ask them now, on, uh, the majority of them would say it's a matter of grave urgency. We are very close, potentially, to some kind of threshold beyond which, uh, for instance, the um, biosphere starts to release very large quantities of carbon on its own, and at that point it doesn't matter what we do in terms of reducing our own carbon emissions, nature takes over. And warming becomes its own cause. Uh, and so they are pretty close, many climate scientists, to a state of despair about the fact that we are not getting ahead of this problem as aggressively as we need to be. This is a problem for most people in this room looking at your ages, is something that's probably not going to affect you too much, but it's going to hammer our children and our grandchildren. It gets really bad towards the end of this century. So there's, there's great incentive to delay, to procrastinate, to say it's not a problem, especially because there's a lot of uncertainty, as you'll see in the next slide. There's a lot of uncertainty about exactly what is going to happen. This is what we're looking at later this century uh, in terms of the kinds of disruptions uh, the world will see. Uh, it, it, it will have a really significant effect on social stability, on economic productivity, on quality of life, for everybody on the planet. You get along 2050, to look at the second from the end there, you get beyond 2050 and every single agricultural region in the world is, is being negatively affected by climate change. Uh, for the next couple of decades, it's possible climate change in temperate zones will increase agricultural productivity. But you get out beyond 2050, and that's a time when the world's population will be somewhere between 30 and 40 percent larger than it is right now. We'll go from a current 6.7 billion up towards 8, 9 billion people. That will be about, probably about the peak global population at that point. And we're going to have even more trouble producing food than we have today because of climate change. And we already have an incipient food crisis on the planet. And there's no place actually to retreat anymore. We have to solve these problems collectively. In fact, it may turn out that the challenges that we're facing may actually produce the next leap of human evolution. This may be the silver lining. That they're actually going to force us to grow up. We've been behaving like a bunch of adolescents. Or, or worse. And it's about time to start behaving like adults. Now, I can imagine 150 years from now, we could be living on our children, our grandchildren, our great grandchildren, could be living on a planet that is substantially warmer than this lost coastline, the lost substantial amounts of biodiversity, uh, that is poorer in the material sense in many ways, but that human civilization could be much more prosperous and humane than it is now, and much more just.
But that's going to depend critically on choices that we make right away. And the choices that we make, the choices that we make, and the choices that we make right away. But also our collective failure to make hard choices. In a democratic society, we're first of all confronted with the overwhelming complexity of things. People are becoming less and less interested in politics as time goes on. They are withdrawing from politics more. They participate less. They're vo voting at lower rates in general. Um, they read about politics less in general. They talk about politics less. And for a democratic society, this is a disaster because democratic society for its reform for its progress, um, for its legitimacy, relies on the participation and support of the people. And that to be citizens and participants in the full sense is really quite demanding. It means that you have to have some exposure to the various kinds of problems that one's community faces. And these problems are various. They're sometimes complex. And it requires some attempt to become aware of and understand these problems. And in order to productively engage with one another, it requires a great deal of us. We need to be able to express our own points of view in ways that other people can understand. We need to be able to listen to them, um, even when we disagree, and understand what is the potential value of what's being communicated to us. And hopefully, in addition, work collaboratively to get to some better sense um, of the problems of our society and how they might be solved. We realize that society is something that we create and therefore something that we can improve. So there's this dimension of critical ref reflection in addition to a social dimension of learning how to engage productively with others and a very practical dimension of trying to make sense of the problems that we are confronting. And as a developmental psychologist, I'm very much attuned to the fact that there's a kind of major set of developments that occur as we grow from childhood through adolescence into adulthood. And there's a way in which our thinking becomes more sophisticated in a variety of ways. It becomes more complex. It becomes more abstract. It becomes more integrative. Um, and then as people with experience of children, we see this. We know the ways in which um, younger children, sort of under the, year, under the age of eight, tend to have a rather narrow focus in life. Their world is of the here and now. Um, they're not interested in delaying gratifications until next week, thank you. Um, and then as our children grow older into adolescence, all of a sudden they live in a world where how other people regard them becomes significant. Rules become significant. People who follow rules are good people. People who violate rules are bad people. Um, and they, their sense of the world becomes a much broader one than just what they are doing at the moment. Um, and this is not only true of how the people are thinking about their friends or their family or their classrooms. It's also true about how they're thinking about politics. And the interesting thing is political scientists don't often attend to the understandings that underlie people's attitudes and preferences in the political domain. Do we meet the requirements of democracy? If we look to the Western democracies today, for example, the US or Canada, do we assume that the normal American or the ordinary Canadian is meeting in some satisfactory way these requirements? And the research on political science offers a very clear and unambiguous response to this. No, we do not. We're not even close. Um, the mantra within political science is that people know very little about politics. And whatever little they do know, they understand badly. Um, and also, as I mentioned, there is the problem of a sense of commitment to these larger societies. That seems to be waning. What is taking place is rather a fragmentation of these large Western societies where people have commitments to their religious group, their ethnic group, their racial group, but they don't have a commitment to this sort of diffuse, broader democratic society of which they are a part. 
I see climate crises or any of the complex issues that we're trying to respond to, whether it's poverty or gang violence or water conservation, as being a crisis of decision making. I, I see these as being a crisis in our ability to work together, a crisis in being able to focus long enough um, to be able to understand the layers of the complexity of the issue, to be able to understand and listen to different viewpoints on the issue, and then move that to decisions that actually lead to actions. Einstein said that we cannot solve the problems with the same consciousness that, that created them. And I'm seeing that all the research that's being done now in, in the field of adult development is helping us to understand what is the, the new consciousness, what is the new form of thinking that is going to be required so that we can deal with some of the issues that we've been creating from a different con a consciousness. So that indicates that there is a change of thinking, a, a different developmental understanding that we need to be moving towards. There's, there's researchers who have been doing a lot of work over the last 20 or 30 years, like Jane Lovinger and Suzanne Cook-Gruder, Robert Kagan, Bill Torbert, Michael Commons, Theo Dawson. They've all been looking at um, how we become complex thinkers, and so if we understand that more, we might be able to match the complexity of our thinking with the complexity of the problems that we're needing to address now. I am a lifespan developmental psychologist, and everybody has to be something, you know, that's, that's what I am. And uh, I have had kind of the, the pleasure and the privilege kind of over the last 30 years of studying from the point of view of a researcher and as a practitioner, just as a fellow human being, we might call it kind of great human unfolding the unfolding of kind of the mind and the heart, the, the gradual evolution of a succession of increasingly uh, complex systems for how humans go about making meaning. Human beings are actively constructing reality and the principles by which they do this constructing themselves evolve. The very principles by which we're making sense of things evolve. So you have two kind of dynamisms going on together. Meaning making and the principles by which we do it evolve. And when you, when you put these kinds of things together, you begin to kind of have a way in to looking at this extraordinary unfolding that I want to give you kind of a picture of in the context of thinking about sort of the hidden curriculum of life, the notion that we are all sort of enrolled compulsorily in, uh, in uh, kind of culture as a school and it has all these different subjects, the frequented roles and arenas of our living, especially you know, our adult living. Uh, any considerations of adult development have to kind of start with the notion that it's a relatively new concept. We tended to have a very powerful notion that almost it was almost as if our sense of uh, mental and psychological development was yoked to our sense of physical development, and we know that most people don't get any taller than they than they are when they're in their early twenties, and we had the sense that um, that the mind and the the development of the self basically um, came to a kind of end in terms of laying in the basic equipment over the same, roughly the same period of time, you know, 20 some years. Here we've kind of sketched out three qualitatively different orders of consciousness. The socialized mind who can be now shaped by society, which is a boon in adolescence, but a limitation in a modern adult world. The self-authoring mind that has the ability to construct your own ideology and framework. And then what we call the self-transforming mind. The ability to take even your own theory your own framework, your own kind of precious frame on the world, and take that as object to recognize that it's reasonable, it obviously has a lot of power, but it certainly will have certain limitations. It will have blind spots too. And the self now becomes bigger than its favorite theory. It is able to hold on to multiple theories or to transform, you know, its current theory. It may be that in order for us to resolve the deepest threats to the human family, we need to develop more of this self-transforming consciousness. 
the research tends to show that 58% of the adult population, and this is based on a number of large samples with different instruments, and they all came to the same conclusion, uh, that about 58% of the adult population is not constructing the world as complexly as the self-authoring mind. That's why the book is called In Over Our Heads. That we're living in a situation where the hidden curriculum of adult life is at an order of complexity that actually outstrips all of us for some portion of our adult life and the majority of the adult population at any given moment in time. What all of this suggests is that there is just as great a need, perhaps even greater because of the responsibilities that adults assume, for forms of education that are just as developmental for people in their 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s as we have been providing as a culture for the young. So even though I told you, oh, 20 years ago people didn't think about adult development, you think, okay, so now we all know this, aren't we smart? We don't have that antiquated idea anymore. We still have that antiquated idea, and we are the, you know, living with the inheritances of that idea because we have not yet actually composed ourselves as a culture in such a way that we're actually addressing the fact that education is not just a preparation for adulthood. The norm, you know, the way that we have thought about it in the, you know, 19th and 20th centuries, but that education is something that must be a part of kind of the lifelong process of developing we've become so scientized in our understanding of the world and in Western science our way of thinking about causation is what Aristotle called efficient cause that is uh, we look for the thing that happened right before the other thing and we say that caused it so uh, why did the nail go into the wood when we're building a house because the hammer uh, hit it directly on the head with a certain amount of force that is what caused the nail to go in. That's the outside-in perspective. Um, but of course, that hammer didn't get up by itself and hit the nail, so it's a very incomplete description of why uh, the, the uh, nail went into the wood. The nail went into the wood because uh, I or somebody wanted to build something uh, in a certain way and use wood to do it. Um, and uh, so first we formed an intention and then we developed a strategy for building the house and ultimately the tactic for uh, hitting, uh, getting the nail into the wood was for us to get a hammer and, uh, and have the skill to use the hammer well. <laughs> Yes, it's true, the last thing that happened was that the hammer hit the nail from the outside, but there was a lot of inside work that went first. And so finding out why things don't happen the way we want them to um, goes beyond uh, asking what was the last thing that happened. Uh, maybe somebody else uh, voted no on, on the proposal we were making, and so we say that person caused uh, the vote to be no. Uh, but in fact, uh, we were the ones who started the process, and so we could also look at uh, how our intent and strategy and tactics uh, may have made it almost inevitable that that person said no. Typically, we assume that when people have more power, they want to protect that power, and they don't want to give it away to other people. Now, that's not always true, but it's an assumption most of us make. And um, in most meetings, you see very little overt discussion about who has the power here and how are we using our power and are we using it um, ethically or, uh, or effectively um, because the assumption is uh, that that would be very threatening to the person who holds the power uh, and that they would use their power to stop the inquiry and there's a lot of support for that. Most institutions don't like their assumptions questioned. And what I'm trying to do is to find out whether a civilization can change that, whether we can change that assumption, and whether there is actually a kind of inquiry that can confront power and test it. Um, and of course, we have, especially in the last hundred years, along with so many examples of extreme uses of unilateral power, we also have some shining examples of cases where inquiry seems to have um, shifted the nature of power. And of course, Gandhi in India and Martin Luther King and the Civil Rights Movement and Nelson Mandela and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission uh, in South Africa, which instead of 
having one race take the power from the other race and then punish the other race, as has often happened, um, where the two races engaged in an inquiry together, and at least uh, for the first 15 years uh, since uh, the movement away from apartheid, um, uh, they have managed to keep the peace, which is quite extraordinary. So um, there's at least we've seen a few occasions when, uh, with very special people, um, it's possible to engage in an inquiry which transforms the power. In my view of nature as self-organizing living systems, they are intelligent and of course many decisions have to be made all the time, whether it's within an ecosystem or within a body, within an individual cell or what have you. We humans have some kind of weird ways of making decisions in our struggle to do it. For example, we vote on things, and when we vote on things, we express an opinion, and then we count as long as half the people want something, the rest have to go along with it. That would never work in your body. The negotiations have to include everyone. The body has a real innate sense that all parts of it have to be healthy, that you can't just have 51% of it healthy and the rest getting sick that the um, heart can't exploit the other organs, nor can the liver, and they don't try to turn each other into a monoculture. The diversity is understood. And yet it's this communion, this sense that for the individual to be healthy, the community must be healthy, that's constantly at play. I often talk about uh, a maturation cycle in biology where young species are feisty, competitive, creative, establishing themselves by reproducing as quickly as they can and acquiring all the territory and resources they can, and that gets them into serious hostilities. That competitive young phase is what Darwin talked about. But what he didn't seem to see was that that shifts into a more mature form of cooperation when species start to negotiate with each other and find that there are efficiencies that you gain by feeding each other instead of killing each other. It's cheaper energetically to feed your enemy than to kill them. And so we have a maturation cycle where, for example, the ancient bacteria worked out for two billion years many lifestyles and hostilities exploiting each other, causing global problems, and then eventually form a larger unity than the one they started with, the bacterial unity, where they come together to form a nucleated cell. And then after another billion years of juvenile phase, we get the cooperative called a multi-celled creature. Now if you put that uh, cycle of maturation together with this ever larger organizations, which is a holarchy, the concept of holarchy, that cells are embedded within organs, within organ systems, within a body. So what happens in your body is this maturation cycle is constantly being played out in negotiations that are about decision making. So at every moment in your body, cells have to negotiate with their organ and the organ has to negotiate with the whole system. So they must be aware of each other and if self-interest is met at every size level, from cell to the entire body, then the negotiations among the levels drive toward cooperation. Self-interest is not selfishness. The cell has to meet its needs. The organ has to meet its needs. The body as a whole has to meet its needs. For everyone to meet their needs at every level, a lot of negotiation has to happen. And this body wisdom again is that getting my way entirely will not work well for me. It's cancer when cells stop negotiating and only look out for their own self-interest. It becomes selfishness. Selfishness is self-interest without regards to other levels of the system. And I think that's where the greatest clue lies for how people should be making decisions about something like global warming.
if not about everything in their lives. If you think, for instance, how will, if I make this decision, how will it affect me? How will it affect my family, my community, my ecosystem, my nation, my global economy? And if you don't find any negatives at any level, go for it. You're a creative human being. If you do find negatives, you'll have to reconsider and negotiate it in a different way. Our, our very survival is dependent on what decisions we make and what will it take for humanity to understand, or those of us who are trying to do social change work, to understand, to notice, to discern, um, and then to work with fact. Everything is decisions. Decisions we have to make are not not in the legislatures and not in the national bodies and not in the international bodies. They're there also. But our, our survival needs, um, that's where the consciousness of the collective is so much more needed. So if we look at how are we currently making decisions and how we traditionally been making decisions, and then we're looking at the complexity of what we need to address. So we might be looking at um, town hall meetings in a community to, to get public input on a very contentious land issue that has quality of life, economic implications, all kinds of implications, and structure a public hearing to get input, but not discussion and not really uh, bombarding, let's say, bombarding officials with opinions and assertions, but not creating a mechanism for even the officials, not to mention citizens, to, to decide to sort through how do you coordinate all the competing tensions and interests and needs? Um, how do you coordinate all those voices? Another one, certainly prevalent, um, and I think the language we use to couch these things is particularly worth paying attention to because they mask the complexity. So we want to fight global warming. We want to fight poverty. We want to fight homelessness. We want to fight crime as if they're its that can be put down like an enemy and that's not the case so our our the systemic nature of the issue is masked by that label it's a thing that we can solve it's a fix-it problem it's a technical problem but no they're not they're systemic conditions we've co-created and maintained and the requirement to first understand that and have a process that will pull apart the label into its constituent parts that made it up to begin with and then to have the decision-making processes to address um, each, each of those in the complexity and then to coordinate and integrate decision-making at different scales. Um, again, we don't have that capacity. We don't yet have the recognition that not only are the labels masking what the complexity is, like one thing, crime, poverty, global warming, but, but we haven't yet institutionalized or even um, begun to name the need, our processes don't serve us well. It's not a solution fair, a marketplace of ideas where we pick the best solution and count how many people voted for it and that's the one that'll work. No. It won't. It'll be business as usual, and we'll still be decades later, generations later, saying we have to fight poverty, fight crime, and fight global warming. This deliberative democracy is presented as a kind of broad sweeping institutional solution to some of the difficulties which democratic society is now facing. It is an attempt to involve ordinary citizens more directly in the process of governing. And the way in which they are engaged is not merely by casting a ballot, but rather by talking with one another in an attempt to understand a problem, what are the alternative possible solutions, express their own point of view and recognize the views of others. And in this context, come to some solution upon which hopefully they can all agree. Making recommendations as to how their community and city should approach this problem. In these local deliberations, it's us. It's we, the ordinary people, who are, who are the decision makers. 
And in that sense, what conclusions we come to are necessarily regarded as more legitimate. In the context of a deliberation, you get to hear a great deal about the problem. And necessarily what you know, the amount of information you have, will improve. And the hope is, in the context of trying to express yourself and listen to, listen to others, not only do you know more, but you start to integrate that information and understand it more adequately. Can we cut carbon emissions fast enough to save the Greenland ice sheet? Can we close coal-fired power plants fast enough to save at least the larger glaciers in the mountains of Asia? These are questions we're facing. Can we arrest the deforestation of the Amazon before it reaches the point of no return and, and the Amazon rainforest becomes vulnerable to fire from natural causes? And then we won't be able to save it. These are the questions that we are going to decide one way or another. Not the next generation. The game's going to be over long before they're in a position to make decisions. We're going to decide. We used to talk about, in, as environmentalists, about saving the planet. It's now clear that what's at stake is not the future of the planet. It's going to survive. What is not so clear is whether civilization is going to survive if we stay with business as usual. We've got to change the system. We've got to restructure the economy. We have to do it quickly. That means become, becoming politically involved. Saving civilization is not a spectator sport. We all have a stake in it. It means whether you're working to close coal-fired power plants or, or develop a high-class recycling program that will save enormous amounts of energy, or whether it's, it's, it's developing renewable energy resources, these are the issues we have to work on. And every one of us has to become involved. We do have the capacity to evolve in response to the seemingly overwhelming issues like climate change, and we can just generate the necessary range of approaches um, to produce a, a meta-level response so that we can understand well enough and coordinate the actions that will really change whole systems, which these complex issues really are about. And yet we need support to pull that off and to do that together. We need new methods, we need new ways of working together. Public deliberation, when it's well designed and well used, can develop our collective ability, our individual and collective ability, to respond more adequately to deal with our complex challenges, such as climate change, the most complex of all. And by well designed, I mean not just the surface considerations of process, but I mean enabling us to really analyze and grapple with the real tensions we're going to have to face, tensions between competing perspectives, what should be done, how should it be done, and the hard choices about what trade-offs can we live with, which consequences can we bear, because we will have to bear some. And after many years of community development work and research and community leadership programs, I found over and over that the public involvement processes in use um, in the leadership frameworks and purposes named were not supporting citizens or local government or organizations to do that kind of deep analysis that can lead to grappling with the complexity we have to deal with. Nothing was changing, nothing was getting more adequate. So I designed a process I call TIP, the Integral Process for Working on Complex Issues, in order to provide the progressive steps for people to really get at the analyses, the decisions, and the array of actions they needed to agree on in order to respond to issues. And this is because people have to unpack the sub-issues, all the layers that make up the, the complex topics we say we're concerned about. Uh, things like uh, water shortages and air pollution, these big topics. Peel the layers of the onion so we can see these as whole systems of interconnected, tangled issues with multiple causes and no simple fixes. After people can work like this together, they reveal to themselves all these sub-issues and they need to identify the smart leverage points to start working on them. Uh, they also need to see how working on issue A and B over here will have needed ripple effects on issue X and Y over there because they're 
interconnected tangles of issues. That's part of the complexity, also makes more impacts. So to pull this off, we need to understand root causes, and we need to understand viable sets of possible solutions. For many of those, it means long-term institutionalization of changes, and some of that demands policy approaches. But a lot of it is voluntary stuff. Individuals, associations, organizations at all levels can just jump in and start doing once they know it's needed and how it will affect the issue. And one thing that was fascinating was through my research in adult development, behavioral science, and complexity science, I realized the reason the steps of TIP work is that they follow the natural and universal steps that we all need to go through in the process of developing more complex thinking and solving complex problems. My early research indicates that not only do our responses to the problems issues improve when we go through this process, but that participants, no matter what their capacities and life situations, are impacted in a growthful way in the process. So working on issues systemically develops more systemic thinkers, and we sure as heck need more of that. This reinforces my hypothesis that we can indeed foster our individual and collective evolution. So I do have a lot of hope that we have the capacities to address the complexities that face our species if we're supported by structured processes to analyze and to deliberate our way through the complexity and if we're willing to put in the effort it's going to take from here on out. become almost paralyzed in our ability to deal with climate change issues. Uh, we seem to be unable to make the kind of informed public decisions, the comprehensive decisions that we need to. And I think a lot of that is because of the um, simplistic and uh, adversarial governance processes that we use. Um, we need to commit to and, and fund well-designed processes that can help us bring our best selves forward to do this kind of work. When I've worked with different cultures, um, I'm finding that people really, really do want to make a difference. They of the global system. It's it's common characteristic across all of these instances of social breakdown that the societies and institutions have been overwhelmed by multiple shocks and stresses simultaneously, and that is exactly the kind of situation we're creating in the world today, which is one reason I'm so enormously concerned for the future of my children. If you'd asked climate scientists half a dozen years ago or ten years ago how, what they thought of the, the Earth's climate problem, uh, they would say, well, it's very serious, we need to do something about it. If you ask them now, on, uh, the majority of them would say it's a matter of grave urgency. We are very close, potentially, to some kind of threshold beyond which, uh, for instance, the um, biosphere starts to release very large quantities of carbon on its own, and at that point, it doesn't matter what we do in terms of reducing our own carbon emissions, nature takes over. The warming becomes its own cause. Uh, and so they are uh, pretty close, many climate scientists, to a state of despair about the fact that we are not getting ahead of this problem as aggressively as we need to be. This is a problem for most people in this room looking at your ages, is something that's probably not going to affect you too much, but it's going to hammer our children and our grandchildren. It gets really bad towards the end of this century. 
So there's, there's great incentive to delay, to procrastinate, to say it's not a problem, especially because there's a lot of uncertainty, as you'll see in the next slide. There's a lot of uncertainty about exactly what is going to happen. This is what we're looking at later this century uh, in terms of the kinds of disruptions uh, the world will see. Uh, it, it, it will have a really significant effect on social stability, on economic productivity, on quality of life for everybody on the planet. You get along 2050, to look at the second from the end there, you get beyond 2050 and every single agricultural region in the world is, is being negatively affected by climate change. Uh, for the next couple of decades, it's possible climate change in temperate zones will increase agricultural productivity. But you get out beyond 2050, and that's a time when the world's population will be somewhere between 30 and 40 percent larger than it is right now. We'll go from a current 6.7 billion up towards 8, 9 billion people. That will be about... really do want to make a change for the future, and I think uh, people want to work for the common good, both locally and globally. We're already doing a lot to take care of our local commons, such as forests, food growing, and culture. But with climate change, it's becoming more obvious that we need to be thinking as global citizens, making collective decisions about our global commons, such as oceans and atmosphere. In this world of uncertainty, we are facing uh, a whole bunch of problems simultaneously. We're in a situation of converging stresses. And this is something I stress in my last book. Uh, the upside of down, I identify a, a number of challenges that humankind faces. I call them tectonic stresses, uh, pressures that are building up under the surface.